This video is about my experience as a cataract surgery patient. And this first video is about what happened before I went in for surgery. So the question is, why should you watch this video? And the answer is because you're curious about cataracts and IOL surgery. Uh, I have been to two different doctors and hospitals. My left eye was very successful. My right eye had the most common fail. We'll talk about why and what that is. And this is part one, and we're gonna cover eye basics that I should have known before I went in. What are cataracts? How did I select doctors? Uh, why, why and how I failed to prepare for visits? Uh, what a doctor appointment consists of for IOL surgery? Interocular lenses, the different types. Uh, the lessons I learned, the mistakes I made. Yes, I made mistakes. And why my first surgery did not meet expectations. So uh, I want to emphasize this is my experience as, as a patient. I'm not a doctor, nor am I medically trained. Uh, I'm using this particular format because there's a lot of stuff to cover and I do not want to forget things and waste your time rambling on and on. So first off, I am not a doctor, nor am I medically trained. This is not medical advice. I am only sharing my experiences as a patient. Always get your uh, advice, diagnosis, treatment from your doctor, not from the internet, not from me. All the information I'm offering is as is. There's no guarantee on correctness and it's going to change over time. So use at your own risk. Now, okay, we got all that legal stuff out of the way. How did I know I had cataracts? My nearsightedness, myopia, had required new glasses sooner and sooner. Over the last two years, my vision got worse at an accelerating rate. It was frightening. The last pair of glasses I needed uh, replacing after only six months, and my right eye had changed by one diopter in just six months. The lenses I needed were very thick and they distorted my vision except right out through the front, but everything else was just like wavy. Yeah, uh, the optician, the technician said I might have cataracts. Uh, I was 61, I didn't want to believe that, uh, but my ophthalmologist, uh, who's a doctor of course, confirmed it. Cataracts are a change in the eye's lens and they usually increase myopia and cloud the vision. And so this over here is a doctor's view of a cataract. Now you won't see this if you just look in your own eye in a mirror. Of course, they have that special slit lamp thing that they use and that's what you're seeing here. If I had gone for regular checkups, which I did not do, uh, I would have caught this earlier and I would have wasted a lot less money on glasses uh, trying to chase that and I would have had more time to prepare as a patient. So the symptoms, uh, the symptoms per the Mayo Clinic website, it's a very good source of medical information. Those with the check marks is the one, are the symptoms I had and those with the dots I did not have. So clouded, blurred, or dim vision, yes. Increasingly difficult with vision at night, absolutely. I was almost blind to my right eye at night. Sensitivity to light and glare, not in my case. Need for brighter light for reading and other activities? Oh, absolutely, yes. Seeing halos around lights, yes. It's frequent eyeglass contact lens prescription changes, as we just discussed, and fading or yellowing of colors. This happened, but I did not notice until after the surgery when they replaced it and the colors all came back. And double vision in a single eye, yeah, I, I didn't have that. So let's look at a 3D model eye and it will help make the uh, explanations following clearer. If you're considering cataract surgery, there are four key parts of the eye and it helps to know where they are and their names. So when you talk to your surgeon, you'll know what they are talking about. Let's start with the outside of the eye. These red things out here are the muscles and their attachments. When you glance around, uh, these are the muscles that move your eyeball. If your surgeon is going to give an injection to mobilize the eye during surgery, they're going to do it underneath the eye. They're not going to inject into the eye. Okay, so let's open this up, look inside. This ball is not critical to cataract surgery. It represents the vitreous gel that is inside the eye. And it's a clear gel that helps hold the shape of the eye. If you have pressure problems like glaucoma, that's probably where it's going to happen. But that's not involved in most cataract surgery. For reference, back here is the optic nerve. 
that carry signals to the brain. Also, the blood supply comes in here. The first part we're going to talk about is the retina, and this is where the image forms. If you're familiar with a film camera, this is where the film would be, or in new digital cameras, this is where the sensor is. If you're short-sighted, the image from your natural lens is focused in front of the retina, and if you're far-sighted, then it's focusing behind the retina back here. The second key part of the eye is the cornea, and it supplies about two-thirds of the eye's optical correction. I always thought it was just a cover over the eye. In fact, it's an important part of the lens system. Behind it is the iris, which is not involved in most cataract discussions regarding IOLs. Um, this piece, which, let me get it out of there. This piece is the center of most IOL surgery, and it's actually two key parts. Outside is the capsular bag, which is like a clear plastic sac that covers over the other piece, which is your natural lens. What the surgeon is going to do is pierce the eye into the capsular bag and using a special tool, cut up the existing natural lens because it's become cloudy and no longer transmits light well. It's likely milky or brownish yellow. They will do this, they will cut open the front of the bag and here, let me open it uh, so you can see. Okay, that came off. They will remove the bag's front and leave the back part. Now, they don't take it out of the eye like I've done. That's just for clarification. Uh, all this is done in place in the eye. Then after they've removed the lens and the bag front, they clean up and check everything. Then they insert something that looks like this. It will be clear. It's a prescription lens. These little arms will help hold it in place. It will go inside the capsular bag like this. And that will be the eye's new lens. There is something else to note while we're here. In about 30% of the cases, cataract patients, this back part of the capsular bag will also turn cloudy over time. They used to call it a secondary cataract. It is fixed by going to your doctor's office and they'll use a YAG laser to shoot through the cornea and lens. The laser is gonna cut up the back part of the capsular bag and the body will clean up the leftovers itself. The doctors don't have to make any incisions or anything. It's, it's just done in the office. Uh, when it's gone and your vision is, uh, it will clear up. I'm mentioning this because once this back part of the capsular bag is gone, it's very difficult to implant an IOL in there because the bag is used to position it correctly in place. Once the rear bag is gone, specialized procedures are needed and a lot of surgeons don't do them. If you might need other eye surgeries, such as a lens exchange, definitely discuss that with your doctor before you have the YAG laser capsulotomy to ensure it doesn't limit or prevent other future options. The basics on eyes and cataracts. In grade school, I learned that nearsightedness was what happened when your eye was focusing in front of the retina. So the retina is back here and the clearest image is right here. That makes you nearsighted. That is because the eyeball is longer than normal. That's one of the causes. Uh, it can also have other causes. For example, if the cornea is curved too steeply. Farsighted, which is down here, is when the image focuses behind the retina, so back here somewhere, and that may be because the cornea is overly flat, so we can see a normal eye where the image focuses right there at the retina. So I have very flat cornea, which uh, should mean I was farsighted, but I'm nearsighted. So that contradiction may be part of the reason I had issues when I went to uh, have my surgery, first surgery done. Some interesting things, the natural lens only provides one third of the image. So this is the natural lens right here. The cornea supplies two thirds of the image. And okay, so glasses, when you're correcting, it's uh, it, a mild is less than three diopters correction for glasses. Moderate is three to six. Severe is six to nine and extreme is greater than minus nine. Farsightedness, mild is less than plus two and extreme is greater than plus six. To focus our natural lens, this is squeezed and it's pulled and pushed at by these muscles right here. And it's flexible and so it moves, it gets thinner and thicker and that changes the uh, image and it focuses like a camera focuses. Press myopia is when this lens starts getting thicker and the muscles get weaker and you can no longer focus as easily. Usually it happens up close. Um, 
and it begins about age 40. By mid 50s, the lens is hardened and the muscles have gotten weak. And usually this is when people get cheaters reading glasses. So yeah, this is important to remember for later. What is a cataract? A cataract is a thickening. It's an increased density of the natural lens caused by UV damage, aging, and so on. I never wore sunglasses, that's part of it. And it oftentimes comes with a color change, yellowish or brownish color change. It's very gradual. I did not notice the, the change in the color. Uh, and the thickening usually increases nearsightedness. So that's what was going on with me. So your myopia will suddenly start to increase. I got so nearsighted that my glasses were tremendously thick and it just distorted the whole world. Most people will develop cataracts by age 75. I was 61, so I was way ahead of schedule. The IOL replacement can restore normal vision in most people, but you will not have the focusing and the accommodation because what they're doing is they're removing this flexible piece of tissue with a piece of plastic and the plastic will not change shape to, in order to uh, accommodate, in order to focus. So what does a surgeon do? He replaces this natural lens with a piece of plastic, as I mentioned. Uh, I'm going to make a more detailed video. So part two of this will be about my surgical experiences. Uh, the week before you start giving yourself different eye drops every few hours. So uh, yeah, that was just kind of uh, medication you give yourself. The surgery was annoying. Uh, I would not say it was painful at all. In fact, I didn't feel anything. It's kind of strange. It's like, is it over? It's like, over? Okay. Um, yeah, I didn't even know they were doing anything. And it's relatively fast. The first one was about 25 minutes. The second one was 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, the pre-surgery is a very boring couple of hours. The, you're going to be laying there. They put lots of drops. They monitor you and such. Uh, again, the actual surgery less than 30 minutes. Uh, they bandage your eye and you go home. The at-home self-care lasts two to four weeks and you do a lot more drops hourly and every day for several weeks. Like glasses, IOLs can correct hyperopia. So that's farsightedness, myopia, nearsightedness, astigmatism, and so on. Uh, unlike glasses, IOL correction calculations have many more factors. So they're gonna take many more measurements than just kind of stick you in front of an eye chart and have you read numbers. Uh, for example, if you have a bigger eye, a longer eye, a flatter cornea, those all affect the calculations to, to pick the IOL that's correct for you. Uh, they can combine and conflict to produce different calculations. So the doctor is going to measure many, many different parts of the eye and it has to be done very accurately. One research paper that I read listed up to 12 factors. That is 479 billion different outcomes that are possible which is why you need to get your information from your doctor because what works for me or works for your friend, yeah, it's not gonna work for you. Fortunately, most people have average factors, so the typical measurement practices work very well at about 96% of the IOL cases. Let's talk about doctors and appointments. So how did I select my right eye doctor? Well, I asked around, I asked relatives, I found a place that seemed to have a good reputation. That's very weak. Uh, what did I do to prepare for my right eye visit? The first one, nothing. I counted 100% on the doctor. That was a mistake. Uh, so what happened on the right eye visit? Okay, well, ordinary refraction. So put me in one of these machines, measured things, looked for disease, uh, gave me a cataract diagnosis, which was no surprise, of course. Uh, we went over basic information on IOLs, types, correction, price, and the conclusion of that first one was to think about it and come back if I was interested. So what was the decision to go ahead with the surgery on my right eye? Well, first of all, it's like, woohoo, I won't have to wear glasses. I'm gonna have my vision restored to like it was when I was in fifth grade before I had glasses. Yay, yay, it's, it was all very emotional. There wasn't much logic involved. Uh, so what did I do to prepare for my second visit for my right eye? Nothing, again, I counted on the doctor, so I repeated that mistake. Uh, what happened during that second visit? Well, she did extended measurements, took photos. She did a test for tear duct drainage to the sinuses. Now that's a very strange thing. They stick a little tube down in the corner of your eye and uh, push salt water through it to see if your tear ducts drain into your sinuses. It feels strange, it's not painful, but it is strange. She did ultrasound versus optical. Now there's a debate in the community about uh, 
about which is better, but here's a uh, journal if you care to read about it. Uh, the conclusion that the, they reached was that it's roughly the same thing. We decided on a 45 centimeter preferred focus distance to fit my lifestyle of reading, computer work, hobby stuff. We selected the monofocal IOL and the right first. We would do the right one first since that my eye was, that was the worst one. And then we planned to do the left eye a couple weeks later. Uh, I had the choice of being awake or asleep. Of course, the uh, anesthetic costs more. It takes longer the recovery time and it increases risk anytime you're under. We signed uh, legal no sue waivers and yeah, that's gonna happen and lawyers make lousy doctors. So, you know, that's, that's not a solution to anything. Just make sure things go right because uh, the lawyers aren't gonna fix anything. I paid half the money down. I discussed uh, what to expect the day of the surgery. So for example, she gives an injection under the eye with a needle to paralyze the muscle so the eye won't move. Second doctor did not do that, but it was you know, it's kind of a weird thing. It's not in the eye, but it's under the eye. Uh, we got, uh, she went over post-op instructions, absolutely no water in the eyes, uh, how to clean your hair without getting water in your eyes, how to take a shower without getting uh, water in your eyes, so like from here down. Uh, the use of the eye drops she gave me, swimming was an absolute no-no, lifting heavy weights, absolute no-no, uh, and she gave me four sets of eye drops uh, to start four days prior to the surgery. So these are, uh, this goes in before and then there's eye drops after the surgery. And then she said to come back early morning on the day of the surgery. So how did I select my left eye doctor? Well, after four years of going around and around with the first hospital, which again, this was, that was ill-informed. Uh, I just demanded they give me the name of the best uh, ophthalmologist surgeon in the area, which they begrudgingly did. Uh, what did I do to prepare for the left eye visit? Well, I had multiple eye measurements by different doctors, so I got second opinions uh, before. And then I did a thorough layman's research of the options. I researched mono and multifocal monovision, which is not the same as monofocal. Uh, I learned about uh, doing lens exchanges where they take out the lens that wasn't right and put in a new one. And then corneal modification, uh, that's like LASIK and so on. Piggybacking to fix the correction in the right eye that was not right. And I checked out the doctor's credentials. I asked other doctors. I, asked the, I looked at the medical school where he teaches. I did, looked at his publications, specialties he to acquire, and then any source I could find. So what happened on the left eye visit number one. Well, he did an ordinary refraction, and that's the eye measurement. He did an eye checkup, check for disease, so that's standard practice. Cataract diagnosis, again, no surprise. Detailed scans and measurements. He did not do ultrasound, no sinus drainage test. He did uh, optical. I inquired about special issues with my eyes, so that's one thing I learned. I asked about the unique features of my eyes, the size, the cornea curvature, astigmatism, that would affect which calculation model he was going to use. Uh, so that way it would improve my rate of success as much as possible. So I have four non-normal factors. So he could deal with those by laser inferometry during the procedure. And that is where after they remove the lens, they shine a laser in here. It's kind of like a grocery store scanner. And it takes a very accurate three-dimensional measurement of the inside of your eye. I was prepared for an advanced discussion on IOLs, so I knew what focal range I desired and why, about my lifestyle, what kind of things I did in my life. Uh, I knew about IOL options for my left and right, so that's like mono, uh, multifocal IOLs. And so he gave me two monofocal IOL choices to research for my, for my left eye surgery. The, he also noticed that uh, I had a retinal tear detach in my left eye. So if we look at the photo, this is the machine that does that. They fire a laser into your eye through the lens and they weld parts of the back of your eye. So like if you have an attached part of your retina back in here, they can actually weld that in place. And that's what he did. Uh, I got eye drops to take home for the retinal repair. That's separate from the surgery. Pay the bill and then he told me to consider my options and return if I wanted surgery. So what did I do before the second left eye visit? Well, thorough research, consideration of options that he, we had discussed the first time around. 
I decided on an extended range monofocal IOL and it's a bit more expensive. Uh, the range extension is not huge. It's like centimeters and inches, not meters and yards. And of course it does not, it does no accommodation. Uh, I decided on an IOL brand. It was just a common brand. I won't mention any brands here, but it's just one of the most common brands there is. Uh, I decided on a focal length of 35 to 50 centimeters. Now that's a range. They, if you say I want 45 centimeters, which is the range I actually wanted, they won't do that. They will give you a, a, uh, a from and to distance. And yeah, so that this is computer distance for someone who's nearsighted. So note that the targets that you discuss with your doctor are best efforts and not exact. And if you ask them, they will tell you that. What happened on the left eye visit number two? Okay, so ordinary refraction, eye measurements, detailed scans. So he ensured that his uh, retinal repair was okay. He did opti detailed optical measurements for the IOL correction calculation. He did not use ultrasonic, he did all the, these optically. We discussed my IOL decision, confirmed the focal range desired was computer distance 35 to 50 centimeters. Uh, the doctor had high resolution images of my scans on a big screen TV like this, so he could show me all the different parts he was talking about, and that really helps. We discussed future options. So uh, he was going to do the left eye first, and then if that did not fix problems, if I could not live with the right eye, then we would discuss uh, swaps. But those two things are joined, so we discussed them together. But Again, the details on the right would be left for the future. So uh, left and right IOL choices are linked because he will not mix monofocal and multifocal lenses uh, between the eyes. So if you have monofocal on one, he's gonna put monofocal on the other. Uh, some doctors will mix them, but he will not. He advised strongly against the multifocal exchange on the right. So yeah, um, therefore the left eye also had to be uh, monofocal. Multifocal uh, puts more stress on the eye, and in a lens swap, you've already had surgery done on this eye. That's a lot of violence done to your eye. So uh, yeah, the additional stress of putting in a multifocal, he, he absolutely recommends against that. Again, my doctor, check with yours. There was an option to clean the capsular bag, so that's the back part of the, uh, of the, of the uh, behind the lens and that can eliminate or delay a later YAG capsulotomy. First doctor did not discuss that. We talked about surgery, uh, how he was gonna do the laser inferometry, uh, laser scalpel uh, versus uh, a mechanical scalpel, and he recommends the mechanical scalpel. Some research I read says that they have about equal uh, results. Uh, we've discussed hazards, so for example, the biggest one is infection. I paid 100% of the cost, which was approximately three times more than the cost of the right eye. And note that this does not include unforeseen complications. If something goes wrong during surgery, uh, check with your doctor, but the two doctors I dealt with, anything extra during surgery, that was tacked onto the bill. And it can actually add up to quite a lot. So you may wanna check with your insurance also. So I had two eye drops to start about two weeks prior. Uh, it was an antibiotic and anti-inflammatory, and then just schedule for the pre-surgery, surgery, and post-surgery times. This is a comparison of the right and left eyes. So uh, the first surgery, the right, the tear duct, tear duct drainage test, yes. Left eye, no. Right, I paid half up front. Left, I paid all up front. Right side, uh, four sets of eye drops, left two sets of eye drops, right ultrasonic measurements, left optical measurements, right. They had more of an assembly line attitude at that hospital, less individual. One of the reasons the second doctor cost more, it was a private institute and yeah, they charged more. The left uh, was two times, two and a half times, almost three times higher than the right. Uh, the left needed a, a retinal repair before surgery. And yeah, that was an additional cost. When I did the right eye, I had no medications that stopped. Now I'm taking uh, some heart medications. And so I stopped 48 hours prior. Uh, it was aspirin and statins. And that's again per my doctor. Let's talk about IOLs or interocular lenses. And actually this is 
two different types I have here in the illustrations. Common choices for IOLs, uh, monofocal, that's what I have. I have uh, two of them, one in each eye. They're the simplest and the cheapest. Uh, glasses will likely be required either for near or far vision, depending on how you have the uh, IOL set. They give most people the sharpest vision. So yes, they are simpler. They will require uh, glasses, but they are also the sharpest. They can be toric, which means they can correct for astigmatism. And most, uh, many insurance providers cover the cost. Of course, check with yours. Monofocal extended. Um, they give longer in-range focus. They're actually a monofocal, so one of mine is monofocal extended and the other is simple. I really can't tell much difference, but okay. Uh, it costs a little bit more. Glasses may still be needed, but less often. Most people have clear vision, yes, because again, it's pretty much this same type of, of IOL. They can be toric, again, astigmatism correcting, and insurance may or may not cover the extra cost of of the extendeds. Monofocal, they have even a longer in-focus range. They're significantly more expensive. Uh, they currently provide the greatest focal distance, focal range, but the vision is not as clear. They can be toric, so again they correct for astigmatism. Uh, many people experience rings and haze around lights, especially at night, and some people find driving difficult or impossible at night and many insurance company companies do not cover the additional cost. Common choices for IOLs continued. Accommodating lenses. So these are like your natural lenses. They will flex. They're expensive and low success rate for older patients for, because of what we discussed earlier. The muscles get weak and they just won't, they just won't move the lenses. Many insurance plans don't cover the additional costs. And for these two reasons, both of my doctors won't do these anymore. They had at one time, but they don't do them anymore. UV adjustable and other future technologies. Well, the UV adjustable are so new that data is very sparse. They're unproven in comparison to the, uh, say the monofocal IOL. And a lot of insurance co companies don't cover experimental treatments. Of course, check with yours. Monovision procedure. Now this is a procedure, it is not a monofocal IOL, not the same. What they do is they implant a different diopter monofocal IOL in each eye. So one eye is set closer to the, than the other by about 1.25 diopters. I have this by accident, but mine is much greater than 1.25. Uh, there's a similar procedure they do with glasses, contacts, Lasix, and so on. Uh, and from my reading, it's a love-hate with doctors and patients as one of those things that patients either love it or hate it. Uh, of course, again, get advice from your doctor. Uh, I got contact lenses to simulate it before my second surgery. Because of my bad first surgery, uh, the, some doctors gave me contact lenses and glasses, a combination of both, to simulate what I could see if I had uh, this mono, uh, mono vision as opposed to just two monofocals. Uh, of the same correction, I should add that. My experience, um, yeah, with this monovision, I have a loss of depth of, uh, depth of field, uh, so depth perception is weaker, and it took me quite a while to adjust to the uh, difference. Okay, things learned, often the hard way. Cataract surgery is the most frequently performed surgical intervention in the world, over 20 million a year. Uh, and doctors can get a little bit assembly line about it. So you need to remind them, uh, especially when it comes to pushing your lifestyle, make sure that they understand your lifestyle. It's a big deal for you. Make sure it fits your lifestyle. Make sure the doctor understands that. Give the surgeon a complete medical history. All medications used, prescription or non-prescription, for example, antihistamines, they actually can affect things. So yeah, don't say, oh, it's just over the counter. Include all your medicines. Any eye injuries, surgeries, radiokeratotomy, anything you've had in the past, other health, health issues, heart, lungs, kidney, anything like that, write it down before going, don't count on your memory. Articulate clearly your desired lifestyle. When would it be okay to wear glasses near, far, or both? Uh, for example, doctor, I do not want to wear glasses when I'm knitting, watching TV, reading books, computer, or playing golf, tennis, hiking, driving, signing papers, uh, reading investment materials, handicrafts, welding, woodwork, anything like that. You can tell your doctor, I do not want to wear glasses when I'm doing this. 
again, make sure they understand your needs. Write that down before the appointment. Don't go in there and kind of you know, wing it. Uh, this, is, this is a very important thing for your doctor to know. Yes, make sure your doctor understands your lifestyle. So me, myself, and I, let me be a little self-centered here. Most of my time is computer work. Uh, so I'm reading, you know, doing hobby stuff, whatever, with my hands. I wanted near vision without correction. So I wanted to be able to, you know, work on something in front of me without having to wear glasses or without having to look over glasses. Therefore, I chose to be nearsighted because that's what I was since I was, I don't know, six, eight years old, something like that. Uh, my right eye did not achieve the target. That was the one that misfired. So it was uh, at two meters plus. So beyond two meters, I can see clearly with my right eye. Uh, with my left eye, I'm right on target. I can see the computer screen in front of me and yeah, everything is hunky-dory. Most surgeons I have talked to or seen in videos, they default to making you slightly farsighted. Now, if that's what you're used to, great. If that fits your lifestyle, great. But if not, you definitely, well, in any case, you want to make sure that your doctor understands your needs. So uh, if, uh, if you're going to be slightly farsighted, you're probably gonna need glasses up close. This is where you'll have the cheaters. After the first surgery, going from a lifetime of nearsightedness to farsightedness, that was a huge transition, yes, because I was super farsighted in this eye. And this eye wasn't working very well because the cataract was getting worse. So between the two of them, uh, being super farsighted all of a sudden overnight, that was, that was not a good thing. So uh, again, the doctor gave me glasses, uh, contact lenses to simulate uh, in a try before I buy uh, for the proposed second surgery. And yeah, so even from the uh, misfire of the first surgery, uh, some good came out of it. I got to do the, to see what it would be like. So the things I learned, some questions I should have asked. So before the first surgery, I should have asked if it would affect my ability to see up close. So hobby, job, computer, cooking, reading, all that without correction. It's, it's very shocking to go from being nearsighted where you can like read the label of something you're cooking to not being able to read it without glasses. I mean, it's like, oops, I forgot my glasses upstairs and now I gotta shut down the stove and go upstairs and get my glasses because I can't read the label on this thing. I can't even hold it away far enough from my face to, to see it. Uh, will I require glasses to drive, use machinery and so on? Uh, will it cause me to lose my depth perception? So that's what happens with uh, monovision. In my case, it's a little more severe than most. Is the outcome correctable if something goes wrong? Uh, and how would it be correctable? So one of those things is uh, a lot of doctors will not exchange an IOL after a capsulotomy. So that's the YAG uh, lasering of your eye to remove the capsular bag. So if something goes wrong with your eye, you gotta make sure you get right back to the doctor. If, if there's, if the uh, correction is not good, you need to get right back to the doctor because the sooner you make any corrective action, the more successful it will be. Uh, and most of them, if you wait too long and you have the YAG surgery, uh, YAG laser surgery done to remove the capsular bag. So that's this part back here. I should just point it out on the diagram. If this part has been removed uh, to make the eye clearer, most doctors will not do a lens exchange. So you are, you are locked in at that point. Okay, so are you gonna have uh, significant floaters or other vision defects? Well, everyone has floaters. Uh, mine became more noticeable when my vision got clearer, but then after a while, you just get used to them again. They've always been there. They'll probably get clearer after surgery, but again, they, they kind of fade away from, uh, from your uh, focus. But again, talk to your doctor. What is this doctor's rate of success with the procedure? So not in general, not the clinic's rate of success, but your actual surgeons. Have they done whatever they're proposing before? And what's their rate of success? How many times have they done that specific uh, procedure? So whether it's a monofocal versus a multifocal uh, versus a monovision versus a lens swap, whatever it is, how many times have they done that procedure? Uh, look online for references that are not from the doctor's website. Yeah, what I found is information is often just not available. And some surgeons post videos that, that are feel good or testimonials, but they don't contain hard facts. So like what's their percent of success rate? Uh, what bothers me is when I was a kid, I collected baseball cards and we get more information on a, 
a uh, baseball card for a player that we're never going to meet in our lives than we do for the doctor that's performing surgery on us. That kind of bothers me. Be prepared. Ask questions about your situation and convey your needs. But being paranoid does not help, okay? 96% of the IOL surgeries are going to have acceptable outcomes. What you want to do is minimize your chance of being in that 4% where things don't go well. So some miscellaneous notes. Um, I did not know that there are other things that the doctor can do during surgery that can save you time and money later. Yeah, for example, they can clean the capsular bag. So again, that's this back of the, behind the lens, the body has a bag, and they can clean that. And right here, this is the lens that the second doctor exchanged, and you notice how clear and sharp that is? Yeah, and this, you see this, it looks like a dirty window right here. The eye is out of focus. That's because the, his camera is focusing on the back of the capsular bag right behind the lens. And yes, I've got some uh, cells encroaching. They are creeping out along there, and this is called a secondary cataract. And this is why they do the YAG capsulotomy. They go in and they blast that out. They blast out this part, and it clarifies the vision again. But you'll notice that when he did the surgery, he cleaned that, he, kind of like a, a window washer. He cleaned the back of that capsular bag. So that can delay or eliminate the need for a laser capsulotomy later. First doctor did not do that, so again, you can see that's starting to, those cells are starting to grow there. Uh, they can also treat for certain glaucoma issues and others. So as a patient, I wish I had known to ask, you know, while you're in there, what else can you do for me? So what were the expectations? That's what I should have known when I first went to have the surgery done. What can you expect from IOL surgery? So I'm going to create a video on my post-operation results, uh, the poor outcome and the normal outcome. My right eye was first and wow, when I got walked out of surgery and they, well, the next day they took the bandage off, I couldn't believe the colors. I mean, the brightness of the world, it was just like, wow. I mean, it was like, uh, I don't know, it was going from like black and white TV to a color TV. And I had extremely clear vision at uh, long distances. I hadn't seen that well since I had gotten glasses. It was just absolutely amazing. But of course, and I ended up really farsighted, farsighted uh, from that first surgery. Okay, an eye with an, uh, an IOL cannot change focus and accommodate. So we've mentioned that before. There's going to be one clear range, near, intermediate, or far. So this is what you should expect from your surgery. For other ranges, glasses are going to be needed. So if you, if you decide to go far-sighted, you're probably going to need glasses for near-sighted. If you decide to go near-sighted, you'll probably need glasses for far vision. Um, but there are a lot of exceptions to this. Uh, a couple friends of mine, they went for the far vision and they don't need glasses. Uh, they can actually sign documents and whatever. It's uncomfortable to read for long periods of time, but yes, they can get by without them. Um, and yeah, so already said that. Note that these results vary by person because every person's eye has a different geometry. Surgeons cannot always closely predict the outcomes. So. Again, that should be part of your expectations. Eye surgery misconceptions, there are a few. And how can a doctor get something so wrong like in my eye? I'm gonna, I'm gonna have details in a later video, but there is not one formula doctors use to calculate correction. This is what I thought. I thought there's some big formula, they plug in all the measurements and bingo out comes the perfect correction for your eye. No, uh, and my first hint of that was after my surgery didn't go well, the first doctor said, I used the wrong calculation for your eye. She didn't say that she made a math error. She used the wrong calculation, the wrong eye model. So each model is created to predict the results based on subjects that the researcher used. And therefore each model works better or worse depending on how close uh, the patient, me, factors match the subjects in that research group. So the more dissimilar I was from the subjects in the model, so like eye size, retina thickness, cornea, curvature, the less accurate the result can be. So again, she used a formula that did not work well for my eyes. Um, yeah, four significant differences. So I'm outside the bell curve on flat cornea, thin cornea, thicker retina, and bigger eye. So that means on a standard model, uh, 
the ability to predict the correction needed for my eye is not going to be as good. So what I needed was I needed a doctor that had experience in this type of thing. When, when they see it, an eye that's outside the norm, they say, aha, I need to take special steps to deal with this person, not just, okay, I'm going to push them through the cookie cutter and, you know, then deal with it on the other side of surgery. Uh, this goes back to getting a second or third opinion for major medical procedures. That's always been considered good advice. Uh, if I had gone for a second opinion, the second doctor I talked to after surgery when it was too late, you know, caught the, caught the problem and yeah, it would have prevented my, uh, it would have prevented my problems. The most common IOL problems. If you can avoid these, you've boosted your rate of success tremendously. Number one cause of problems, infection. Follow your doctor's orders exactly, especially after the after surgery, when they give you the eye drops, do it exactly what they tell you. If you have signs of an infection, get attention immediately. Do not wait a second, go. Number two pro cause of problems, wrong correction. Yeah, wrong correction and misunderstanding about corrections. So uh, I'm gonna repeat this, the doctors, the second doctor's full IOL measurement would have prevented my right eye correction problems. In other words, I should have gotten a second opinion. Eye surgery is major surgery. 96% goes well, but 4%, one in 25 don't. If you're in that, if you're that one person in 25, it can be life changing. Note that glasses cannot usually be used to correct vision when one eye has an IOL and the other does not. If, especially if the, if the corrections are far off. So in mine, yeah, glasses uh, would absolutely not correct what happened to me. Uh, because, well, I'll go into that in another video, but yes, if your eyes are very different, glasses will actually exacerbate a problem. So if you're going to have one eye done, count on having the other one done. So epilogue, these are my experiences in the pre-operation phase of my IOL surgeries. I'm going to produce other videos for the actual day of surgery, post-operative care, and the things that went wrong with my surgery and that can go wrong in general. And finally, I wish you the best that everything works out really well for you.